Hell no, no this song. She asked, asked me to sing, sing this one. one. Singer or musician, and that trying to do that makes me sweat like, like I ain't never. Makes me think about Blaine that day that they asked him to lead the singing, and uh, he said that was worse than preaching. And I agree with that. All right, we're going to be in Psalm, Psalm 9 to begin with. Here we're doing Bible terminology this evening, but we're not looking at words in particular. Talk about some Bible doctrines this afternoon. We're on Bible doctrine number 40, Bible doctrine number 40, which is the doctrine of hell. 
So we'll, we'll pray, pray together, together and we'll just start right in Psalm 19 here in just a moment. Let's, Let's pray, pray together. together. Father, Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to be back in the service this afternoon. We thank you for the good service this morning. The opportunity to assemble together this season again. We thank you for that. I pray you to help us. Lord, as we look at these uh, few misunderstood Bible doctrines, help us, Lord, to share truth in your word. Take our time, Lord, and, and cover the things that we should. Help us, Lord, to uh, not cover the things that are not necessary. But, Lord, we want to be a blessing. We want to be a help. We want to be thorough. And I pray you to help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Talking about these misunderstood Bible doctrines as we go through our Bible terminology class. And we're Bible doctrine number 40, and that is the doctrine of hell, doing an alphabetical order. The term hell is found 54 times in 54 verses in our King James Bible. Representing all of those verses, I'll use this verse, one that is very well known here in Psalm 9, verse 17. Well, the Bible says, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. Now, we understand that hell is a literal burning place that is located in the center of the earth. Look at Psalm 63. Psalm 63 in your Bible. Psalm 63 and in verse number 9. The Bible says in Psalm 63, verse number 9, But those that seek my soul to destroy it, shall go into the lower parts of the earth. So we see that hell is in the center of the earth. Come to Numbers chapter 16 for just a moment. I won't, I won't read all of these passages of Scripture, but I am going to read some of them. In Numbers chapter 16, when Korah and his crowd rebelled against Moses, God opened the earth and dropped them into hell. Look at this passage in Numbers chapter 16. And we'll begin reading verse number 30. Numbers chapter 16, verse number 30, the Bible says, But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up, and all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave of summer that was that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that appertained unto the Korah and all their goods. Verse 33 says, They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And he's talking about a horrific thing. I could not imagine being present on the day that God opened up the ground, opened up the earth, and swallowed up Korah and his men because of the rejection of Moses and his message from the Lord. Look at Psalm 139. In the Bible, hell is always listed as being in the opposite direction of heaven. I won't read all of these passages, but here in Psalm 139, verse number 8, the Bible says this, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Just read one of several verses in the Bible that, that shows us that hell is in the opposite direction of heaven. Now, now, before the resurrection, resurrection of Jesus Christ, you'll be found in Luke chapter 16, where we'll look at a couple of things there. Before the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there were two places located in the center of the earth, hell and Abraham's bosom, uh, also known as paradise. They were separated by a great gulf. We read that in Luke chapter 16 and verse number 16. Hell is not the grave. I understand that there are many cults that teach that. And I can, there's many reasons that we could dispute that from the Bible, but I can say this, no one burns in the grave like they do in hell. And the Bible plainly says in Luke chapter 16, verse 23, Luke chapter 16, verse 23 and 24, the Bible in verse 22 as well, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried 
and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Verse 24 says, He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And so it's very clear from the Bible that hell is not the grave. It is a place of burning. It is a place of fire. It is a place of torment. Now, the Bible teaches us in Matthew chapter 25, uh, in verse 41, that hell was originally prepared for the devil and his angels. And we know that they rebelled against God in the past, according to Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. Hell was never intended for man, but all those who reject God will be cast into hell. We read that verse on 917 uh, at the beginning. Uh, that was why hell is getting bigger. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 5, it talks about hell enlarging itself in verses 14 and 15. Uh, hell is a holding place for those who reject God. They'll be cast uh, the, uh, until the final judgment day, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, also Revelation chapter 20, and verses 11, and also verse 13. God lets man go to hell who tries to make a liar out of God. You see, every man that has trusted his own righteousness has told God verbally or otherwise that his own righteousness is equal to God's righteousness. And we know that man has no righteousness at all apart from the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also read in Revelation chapter number 20 that hell will eventually uh, be cast into the lake of fire. Uh, the most concise passage, and I ask you to turn there, Luke chapter 16, uh, the description of hell is given an account of the rich man Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. I'll mention these in the verse. I won't read them all uh, for the sake of time. We already read the one in verse 24. Uh, hell is a place of torments. Read that again, verse 28. Hell is a place of unquenchable thirst, verse 24. Hell is a place of forever remembering, verse 25. Uh, hell is a place of darkness, according to Matthew, 2 Peter, and Jude. Hell is a place of fire, according to Matthew and Mark. Hell is a place of brimstone, according to Revelation 14, 20, and 21. Uh, brimstone is another word for sulfur. Hell is a place of wailing and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 13, verse 42 and 50. Hell is a place of falling. Say that because hell is a bottomless pit, according to Revelation 9 and Revelation 20. Hell is a place without hope of escape, Luke chapter 16, verse number 26. Uh, hell is a place of unfulfilled desires and unanswered prayers, according to Luke chapter 16, verses 27 through 31. Uh, hell is a place of remorse. Those who are opposed to hellfire preachers ought to know that the, the term hellfire was first used by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In fact, in the Lord's three and a half years of preaching, Jesus parked on the subject of hell and preached there uh, many times during his uh, more than two times a year during his times of preaching. Uh, there are 162 texts in the New Testament alone which speak of the doom that awaits the impenitent, and over 70 of those were uttered by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. If God, if it isn't God's will that anyone go to hell, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9, God is not, uh, see, what is that verse of Scripture? God is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so the Lord's desire is that men repent and escape the punishment of hell. Now, there's plenty of false teachings about this subject or about this place called hell. There are some who teach, as I mentioned earlier, that hell is simply the grave. When someone tries to tell you that or show you that, show them from Luke chapter 16 uh, about the rich man, verses 22 and verse 23. Ask them to explain Mark chapter 9. Uh, where it talks about our limbs being cut off. It doesn't matter uh, how many of those you cut off. You, you still uh, go to the grave. Amen. Uh, ask them how the grave is like a furnace of fire. Matthew chapter 13. Ask them why Jesus Christ would warn men to be afraid of going to hell if hell is the grave. Hell is not the grave, friend. Hell is the place you want to miss. The only way you can miss that is by putting your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Some teach that hell is the grave. There are still some others that teach that hell is a place of annihilation. Uh, when someone tries to teach you that or someone tries to tell you that, you can also refute that easily from the Bible as well. 
You can, you can so show, show them, them verses that talk about hell being a place of everlasting punishment. punishment. Well, well, if, if uh, hell is an everlasting, everlasting punishment, it certainly can't be annihilation. And so, so Matthew, Matthew 25, 25, verse 46, talks, talks about that. So does Revelation 14, verses 10 and 11. Now, now I ask you a question, question how, how can you shame or punish someone everlastingly if hell is annihilation? You cannot. And, and so, so we, we simply can understand that from the Bible. Uh, let, let me show, show you one example. example. Come, Come to Revelation, Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. I'll show, show you one, one easy to understand example in Revelation, Revelation chapter 19 and Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 19, the beast and the false prophet are cast into hell. Look at verse number 20. Revelation 19, verse number 20. The Bible said that the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and, and them that worshipped the image. Now look what it says. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Now I want you to notice something in Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 10. I will say this now several times in the beginning of chapter 20, the Bible talks about a thousand year period. And it's talking about the millennial reign of Christ. So after that thousand years, look at Revelation chapter 20, verse number 10. The Bible says that the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, were the beast and the false prophet. And notice this next word, are. It's not where they were, it's where they are. So a thousand years later, they are still there in that place of torment. And so it's not a place of annihilation. Now, uh, Jesus told Judas that it would have been good for him if he had never been born. Now, if hell was a place of annihilation, why would Jesus tell him it would have been better for him if he had never been born? He told him that because hell is not a place of annihilation. It is a place of everlasting, eternal, continual torment. And the, 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 there is one time, let me, let me find this here, let me... I believe the Bible teaches that there are degrees of punishment in hell. None of it is pleasant. None of it is good. But I, I think we can teach from the Bible, prove from the Bible that there are degrees of a punishment in hell. We could give you Bible verses for that and uh, talk about that. But I only need to look at one thing here if I can find it. I have a ton, I mean a ton of stuff about hell. But I want to say that hell is going to come to Revelation chapter 21. Hell is like a uh, holding cell, if you will, or maybe hell is like a jail cell, a place where someone stays until they receive their final sentence and they're hauled off to prison. Because the Bible talks about in Revelation chapter 20, let me find the verses of chapter 21 because I can't find my, I can't find my um, notes. Let me look here. In Revelation chapter 20, and I don't have my I'm using a uh, Bible that I'm not used to as well, trying to break in a new Bible. Um, so my stuff is a mark, like I would like for it to be. But the Bible is saying, where's, um, I'm going to find it. Hold on one second, don't tell me. Verse 8. Ah, uh, the fearful, unbelieving. Okay, that's Revelation chapter 21. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Revelation chapter 20. Uh, verse number 8, and let me read verse number 7. When a thousand years expire, Satan shall be loose from prison and shall go out and deceive the nations. God and make God. Verse number 9, they went up the breath of the earth and passed the camp about. Fire came down from God out of heaven, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone and the beast and false prophet are to be told me forever and day and night. Oh, verse number 11 starts about the great white throne judgment. That's what I wanted to see. And I saw a great white throne, him that sat on him, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found a place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things, which were written in the books according to the words. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered of the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so hell, those that are in hell, will be delivered up out of hell, only to stand before God at the great white throne judgment, and to be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. And, and so, so, friend, you don't, you don't have, have to go to hell. If you go there, it'd be because you refuse the message of salvation 
from the Lord Jesus Christ. You choose to do that. God's not going to put you in hell against your own will. You say, Preacher, what do I got to do to go to hell? Nothing. Just continue going like you are, not believing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's where you'll end up. Amen. God's made a way for you to be saved. He's made a way for you to escape judgment. He's made a way for you to escape eternal punishment. And that way is through by His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. John, Jesus Himself said in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man come unto the Father but by me. He's the only hope of salvation, the only hope of eternal life, and the only way to escape the eternal punishment of hell. So that's Bible doctrine number 40, a brief overview of hell. Bible, Bible doctrine, doctrine number 41, humility. Come to Romans chapter 12. The term or the word humility is found seven times in seven verses. The word humble in all of its English forms is found 64 times in 58 verses in our King James Bible. Now, a person who has humility is a person who thinks of himself uh, no higher than he ought to think. Look what the Bible says in Romans 12, verse number 3. Paul says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think him, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man a measure of faith. And so we're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We ought to think soberly according as God has dealt to all of us a measure of faith. Look, we're going to come back to the New Testament here in just a moment, so don't lose your place there. But I want to look at something in Proverbs chapter 15. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. But I want to look at something in Proverbs chapter 15. Now, I want to say that we must gladly humble ourselves in the sight of God, trusting Him to exalt us in due time. That's what we read in Proverbs 15 and verse number 33. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Uh, we're living in a time when there are so many, so many folks who are arrogant, proud, self-righteous, condescending, but the Lord is looking for people with humility. What the Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 12. Now in this chapter, uh, Colossians chapter 3, the Bible talks about putting off some things in verses 8 and 9. And begins talking about putting on some things in verse number 10. And in verse number 12, the Bible says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So the Lord wants you and I to put on humility, kindness, bowels of mercy. May the Lord help us to do just that. James chapter 4, James chapter 4, verse number 6. James chapter 4, <laughs> verse number 6, the Bible says, But he giveth more grace, thank God for that. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Verse number 10 of that same epistle, James chapter 4, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. First Peter 5, 6 says something similar, Humble yourselves therefore in the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And so quit trying to promote yourself. Quit trying to put yourself out front. You trust the Lord. Humble yourself in the mighty power of God, in the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Amen. Uh, look at uh, Bible doctrine number 42, idolatry. We're going to be in Colossians, but I want to look at 1 Samuel to begin with. Idolatry. The term, if you want to be finding your place in 1 Samuel chapter 15, give you just a moment to get there. The term idolatry or idolatries is found in six times in six verses. Uh, idolatry is basically an act of worshiping anything or anyone other than God. When we allow anything or anyone to come between us and God, we're guilty of idolatry. Many have the idea that idolatry can only be committed by stars or by, by, by worshiping 
Many, Many of the ideas of idolatry can only be committed by worshiping material objects, such as graven images, planets, stars, or by worshiping people or animals. However, the Bible informs us that a bad attitude can be idolatry. That's what we'll look at here in 1 Samuel chapter 15. The Bible says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. Oftentimes when we're talking about or we make mention of folks who are involved in sinful things, it is rarely that we ever hear of someone that is living a sinful lifestyle is it mentioned that they are rebellious and stubborn. But the Bible makes it very clear here that this rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It don't get much worse than that. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And so I understand there's some things that you should be... Um, hard-headed about. Maybe I'll use that terminology. We're not going We're not going to deviate from God's Word. We're not going to back up on the King James Bible being the Word of God. We're not going to change our stance on what thus saith the Lord. There are some things that we're going to be dogmatic about. But to be stubborn, a lot of people are stubborn. They're just sitting in their ways. They're not, they're not, not going to hear reproof. They're not going to hear instruction. They're not going to change their mind. They're not going to change their life. They're not going to change their attitude. The Bible says that rebellion is as witchcraft and that stubbornness is as idolatry. Now, look at Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5, the Bible says mortify. That means to put to death. Mortify, therefore, your members which are on the earth. And look at the, look at the list. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And so not only is stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry, but the Bible says that covetousness is as idolatry, which is idolatry is what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 17, verse number 16, the Bible says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athos, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city given holy or holy given to idolatry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14, we are admonished to flee from idolatry. The verse says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. And so listen, if you're stubborn, rebellious, covetous, the Bible tells us that those things are idolatry. Well, we need to be fleeing from idolatry. Paul's writing to the church when he said, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. In Galatians chapter 5, there are 17 works of the flesh mentioned in that passage of Scripture. And down, I think it's maybe, maybe start verse 18, 19, 20 down through there. There are 17 works of the flesh mentioned, and one of those is idolatry. Listen, God knows your heart, and God knows my heart, and anything that is in our heart that is before God is idolatry. Don't let stubborn rebellion Stubbornness, rebellion, and covetous, all those things become idolatry in your life. <clears throat> Bible doctrine number 43, imputed righteousness. Now, the term impute in all of its English forms appears 15 times in 15 verses in our King James Bible. Now, the word imputed is, a, is a, an accounting term, and it means to transfer to another's account. There are several several uh, references we could give for that. There is, there is a few uh, things we could see even in the Old Testament where that word is used. Uh, one, one such passage would be in 1 Samuel chapter 22. Uh, There's an Old Testament instance where King Saul is accusing the priest Ahimelech of helping David in his escape of Saul. And Ahimelech asked the king not to hold him guilty of something he didn't do. In other words, don't impute that to my account. Don't, don't hold me accountable for something that I didn't do. Now come to Romans chapter 4. This is a passage of scripture that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ we really enjoy. Spiritually imputed righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus Christ which has been put onto the account of the new believer. When a sinner forsakes his self-righteousness and fully believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, God imputes the righteousness of Christ to that individual. That's a good place to say amen. And thank you, Jesus, and all of that stuff. 
Look at Romans chapter 4, verse number 5. The Bible says, but to him that worketh not, but that believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So what we have in that passage of Scripture, we see that word used two different occasions. The righteousness of God is imputed to the man that believes the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have any righteousness. We receive his righteousness. And then the Bible says in verse number 8, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. We have plenty of sin. I'm glad the Lord is chosen because of our faith in him not to impute that to our account. Amen. Now, Actually, at salvation, a twofold imputation takes place. Our sins were placed on Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Uh, let, let me turn there and read that. I thought I could quote it. I might could quote it, but I might forget it. Let me see if we get started here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Yeah, the Bible says, For he had made him, speaking of God, had made his son, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so we have been, uh, our sins have been placed on Christ, his righteousness has been placed on us, and it all happens when we, by faith, receive him as our Savior. Now, in Psalm 32, Psalm 32, we won't spend a lot of time in Psalm 32, though we could. It's a great psalm. We've preached for it from it numerous times. But in Psalm chapter 32, David, David is rejoicing over imputation, especially in the first two verses. Look what he says, blessed, Psalm 32, verse 1, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Now, if you know anything about Psalm 32, Psalm 51, it is a penitent psalm, and David is repentant of some sin that he has committed. In fact, he is repenting of a sin in which there is no sacrifice for under the law. He's repenting of the sin of adultery and murder, and he is blessing God for not imputing that iniquity to him, but giving him imputed righteousness. So what a blessing it is, the doctrine of imputation. So, or imputed righteousness. All right, Bible, Bible doctrine number 44, the inspiration of Scripture. Now, the word inspiration is found two times in two verses, while the word Scripture is found 53 times in 53 verses in our Bible. I want you to find Job chapter 32 for just a moment. We'll look at something here, and then we're going to look at some other things. But find Job chapter 32. Contrary to popular belief, the two verses in our Bible where the word inspiration is found, the first time it's used, it has nothing to do with the writing of God's Word. Job 32. It has to do with the understanding of God's Word. I think this is interesting. Look, 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 look what the Bible says in Job 32, verse number 6. The Bible, the Bible says, says Elihu, the son of Bereshel, the Buzzite, answered and said, I am young. I think the Bible is common. I was reading this. I was reading all my notes this morning and I got tickled. And you are very old. <laughs> so you're, you know, I, think, I am young and you're very old. I, you know, people be offended you said that. I can understand why. So Elihu, the son of Barshel, the buzz, I answered and said, I am young and ye are very old. Wherefore, I was afraid and does not shew you my, my opinion. I said, days should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit of man. Now notice this. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. So the word inspiration only twice in the Bible. The first time the word is found in the Bible, it is clear that the inspiration of the Almighty gives man the understanding. That's what we see in Job chapter 32. Now, come to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, we're going to talk about the inspiration of Scripture. We're going to be here for just a little while. Probably the last thing we look at this afternoon. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. 
and verse, verse number 21 talks about the specifics of how the Bible came about. Peter tells us, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. So Peter is telling us that Moses didn't come up with the subject of the words that he wrote in the Pentateuch. Uh, he didn't come up with those words, amen. And David didn't come up with the words that are in the Psalms. Of course, there are other writers of the Psalms as well. Solomon didn't come up with the subject matter that's in Proverbs. Jeremiah didn't come up with the subject of the words in the book of Jeremiah. The Bible says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. For the, then how did it come about, Peter? How, how did this prophecy come about if it didn't come about by the will of man? Look what the Bible says. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so Peter is saying that uh, David, or we'll start with Moses like we did a while ago, Peter is saying that Moses, God, the Holy Spirit, put it into Moses' mind, want to speak, and Moses spoke that, and it was written down. You can go on and on. Same is true uh, with David and Solomon and, and uh, many uh, all throughout the Bible. These, these, these authors, these human authors that God used, they wasn't writing what they thought or their own opinions. They were they, 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 they spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, now let's listen to this process. process. I, I like this in Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Come, Come to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, if you will, will chapter 36. We'll, we'll see this, this process in action in, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 36. I'll give you just, just a minute of time, time to get there. there. We'll read this. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 30, 36, read several verses here in this passage. We'll see this process of men being speaking or God speaking. Holy men speaking as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Bible says in Jeremiah 36, verse 1. And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Joshua, king of Judah, Josiah, king of Judah, that the word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee from the days of Josiah, even unto this day, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah, look what it says, all the words of the Lord. So they, so they weren't, weren't Jeremiah's words. He, he was, was writing from Jeremiah's mouth the words of the Lord. Look, 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 look we're continuing to read the verse. Which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of the book. Verse 5. And Jeremiah, mouth, Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore, go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth. Look what he says. The words of the Lord. In the, in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day, and also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. It may be they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return everyone from his evil way, for great is the anger and the fury of the Lord that have pronounced evil against this people. And Baruch the son of Neriah did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, Reading, look, reading in the book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. Now, if you notice, as I was reading that on a couple of different occasions, the Bible says that Jeremiah spoke, and when Baruch wrote it down, he was not simply writing down the words of Jeremiah. He was writing down the words of the Lord. And those words of the Lord that he had written down, Jeremiah was not going to be physically able to go to the house of the Lord. So he said, I want you to take that book, and I want you to read it unto those people. And you're not going to be reading Jeremiah's words. You're going to be reading the the words of the Lord. Holy men of old spake as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and that word was written down. Amen. What a blessing. And so I'm thankful that God is able to give us his book and able to keep his book. Look at verse number 18 of that same passage. Then Baruch answered them, 
He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Amen. Isn't that a blessing? So we see clearly how this is carried out, how the Lord has taken care to inspire his word. Now, a particular term is used to describe instilling or infusing of God's thoughts into their mind by the Spirit of God, inspiration. Now, how do you explain many times, and we don't have time to go through these examples, but many times in the Bible, I know this is true if you're a Bible student of all, that the writers of the book in the Bible, they wrote about things. They didn't know what they were writing about. They didn't even understand what they were writing, but they were writing down what the Holy Spirit of God told them to write, and they pinned it down. Was it their own thoughts or their own ideas? God used them to write down the word of the Lord. Now, we believe in a word-for-word -word inspiration, meaning that the Holy Ghost gave them every word to write. What a blessing. Now, because they were not merely men's words, but God-inspired words, we're safe to say this. First of all, they are true words. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse number 160, thy word is true from the beginning. Second of all, they are eternal words. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 8, the grass withereth and the flower fades away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Number three, they are living words. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born in not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, listen, which liveth and abideth forever. Number four, they are the source of growth. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. Now, we think about this living word. We may mention the third thing. They are living words. Uh, dead words can only offer death. But I'm glad that living words can offer life to dead individuals. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Now, the reason that multitudes of people gathered around the Lord Jesus Christ as he taught and as he preached, they, they didn't do that because his message was alliterated. They didn't do that because of his illustrations were illustrations that not, had not been heard or seen before. They did that because his words were the living word of God. His words were alive. In fact, Jesus said himself in John 6 and verse 63, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So we believe the inspiration of Scripture, and a closely related topic to the inspiration of Scripture would be the preservation of Scripture. I'm glad that not only was God in charge of getting His Word to us, He is also in charge of keeping the Word that He's gotten to us. I, I, I know people, they, 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 they doubt, they're a lot of folks place a lot of doubt on the Bible, upon the scriptures, and they, you know, they, they try to find fault with the translators and all. And you can do all that if you're relying on man. But I'm not relying on man to keep his word perfect. I'm relying on God to keep his word perfect. And so the same God that inspired his word is the same God that is able to keep his word from this generation forever. We're not, We're not to have confidence in man. The Bible says that in Psalm chapter 118. We're not to put our confidence in man. We're to put our confidence in the Lord. I have confidence that God is able to keep the word that he provided for us. You say, well, I believe it's God's word in the originals. You don't have the originals. You've never had the originals. You've never seen the originals. You don't know anyone that ever seen or had the originals. All we have is a copy of a copy of a copy, and I'm not relying upon man to keep that. I'm relying on the same God that wrote it to keep it. And so I am confident that I have an incorruptible, infallible Word of God in the English language, in the King James Bible, not because I have confidence in King James or any other man, but because I have confidence in God, who is able to preserve His Word. Now, there are several. You know, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 12, the Bible says in verse number 6, the words of the Lord are pure words that silver tried in the furnace of fire, earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation for 
ever. Do you know, several things, several things, several things, things, several things, several things, several things, things from this verse. verse. I should have had you turn to that verse. Um, we, don't we don't have, have a time schedule, schedule but after lunch, lunch on Sunday, Sunday afternoon, people's, people's eyeballs will only stay focused in one direction for a short amount of time, and people's eyelids will only stay up for a limited amount of time. But I don't want to look at several things about this verse in Psalm chapter 12. If you want to turn there, I just read it for you. In Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7, I want you to notice several things about the verse. God's words are called pure. That means that God's words are perfect. That means that they're without blemish. They're without spot. In that same passage against uh, Scripture, the Bible says the words of the Lord are. Notice it didn't say the Lord's words were. It said the Lord's words are. Present tense, amen. The words of the Lord are. Now, if there's any question that what God is saying, verse number 7 is clear, God will preserve His word forever. Now, the originals have long ago disappeared. You won't find them anywhere on this earth. And yet David said here in this passage of Scripture, he told us that the words of the Lord are present tense right now somewhere. And Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 23, that the Word of God abideth forever. And so these promises can't be talking about some lost originals because they're already gone. The promise can only be talking about the copies of copies and miracle of miracles. The copies are pure because they are the Word of God. Much like Moses held a perfect writing, we now call Genesis in his hands. We are promised to that God will keep his Word forever and we have the words of Almighty God in our hands. If I didn't believe we had a perfect Bible, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be preaching. I would have no foundation. I'd have nothing to stand on. I'd have nothing. Well, you know, parts of the Bible is true. I believe if I had an original copy, it would be true. Why don't we just shut up and go home? We have a Bible. We have the words of the living God. I don't have some of them. I have all he wanted us to know. I don't believe that we have all that God knows in the Bible, but I do know we have all God wants us to know in the Bible. Amen. Now, now, so, so we, we, have, we, have, we have the perfect writing in our hands. hands. Now, now, I know that Bible colleges are teaching all kinds of things, all kinds of confusion, causing all kinds of a mess when it comes to this issue of the Bible. Some, some say, some say, say the originals are perfect, perfect, but the Bible we have in our hands today is not, not perfect. perfect. Some, Some say the originals were the product of the Spirit of God, God inspired men what, what to write, and they are perfect. But the Bible in our hands today is the product of human translators translating the words, and they are imperfect. Some are teaching the originals were inspired, but the Bible in our hands today is not inspired. So let me ask you, is your King James Bible inspired? Is your King James Bible preserved? Is your King James Bible, James Bible perfect? Amen. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah, it better, better be the answer. answer. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm glad, glad God, God is able, able to preserve, preserve his word. So you know, the, the word preserve means, means to keep it in an unaltered condition. condition. I, you know, we've used for years, you've heard all the, the illustrations about canning and preserves and, 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 and civil law, and I understand all that. But, but this, this, this God preserving his word goes far, far, far greater than that. He has the ability to keep his word unaltered. And I'm thankful that we have God's preserved word. It is inspired. It is preserved. Now, the original writings of the Bible were perfect. They were alive. They were inspired. The King James Bible that we have in our hand today, they are alive. They are perfect. They are inspired. You say, Preacher, how in the world can that be some 2,000 years later, over 2,000 years, or 2,000 years later and still be perfect? It would be because God has the ability to preserve His Word unaffected and unaltered by the times of the years or by the man that had their hands upon it and around it. God still has the ability to preserve His Word. I'm glad God promised to preserve it. God promised to keep it. And you and I have. I want to say something else too. God is not limited to the Greek and the Hebrew language. He's able to preserve his word in the English language for you and I today. I, I thank the Lord for that. Now, there's so many other things. I, I mean, I got another hour. 
hours worth of stuff on this inspired scripture. Um, why is there so much confusion today about the Bible issue? Well, it, it all goes back to the devil. We trace it all the way back to the devil. Again, all the way back in the, in the book of Genesis. Uh, where Satan asked Adam and Eve, yea, hath God said, and he's never ceased from doing that. It worked then, it continues to work now. People continue to be deceived on the Bible issue because they're questioning God and his authority. Number two, man and his efforts to look educated and appear intelligent have tried to appease the skeptics, but in doing so, they lost the touch of God on their lives. I'm thankful we have a Bible. Amen. Listen to this quote by James Seidler, the son of Harold Seidler. He said, The Princeton theologian, theologians Archibald, Alexander Hodge, and Benjamin Beckenridge Warfield in 1881 were the first to claim inspiration for the original autograph only. In the 1878 Nigeria Creed may well have been the first document to claim inspiration for every word of Scripture, provided such word was found in the original manuscript. So when Warfield and followers stood up and said, I believe the Bible is inspired, he didn't mean the Bible that we hold in our hands. He meant the Bible that was in the original over 2,000 years ago. There's many that do that today. Many, many, I, 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 if you're really careful, I, I read a lot from people who send us doctrinal statements because they are uh, going to the mission field or they want to come to our church and and they want to present some kind of ministry, or believe it or not, people call and they want to come. They just invite themselves to come preach. Ain't that a blessing? And uh, people will call and invite themselves to come sing. Ain't that, a, ain't that a blessing? But you read, you read about some of these people's doctrinal statements, and if you read closely, it won't take you long to believe or understand that they don't believe this book is God's preserved word. They believe it was in the originals. But they don't believe it is today. I, I'm glad I know it is today. God's perfect word. Amen. Well, I'm, I'm just going to stop there. We can go over days. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the living word of God. What I